Hello and welcome back to Clinical Optics Made Easy here at the Davis Street Studios. And I am your narrator, M.M. Wiggins, and today we are talking about magnification. And on today's menu, there are lots of delicious items such as linear magnification, angular magnification. We'll be discussing the best burger I have ever had in my life, as well as Snellen charts and comparisons of those lenses that you may have in your very pocket. As we say over and over, everything that we talk about in this lecture can be found in that book right there, which can be found at that QR code down there or that website down there. But once again, read whatever you would like to as long as you're understanding it and working lots of problems. A good friend of mine who's a pathologist back in Arkansas used to tell his residents, magnification just makes what you don't know look bigger. And, uh, you know, he's a very funny guy, but uh, there's a lot of truth to that. As we look at this family photograph from the 1950s, if I were to ask you which row is closest to the camera at the time this picture was made, you could tell me, not based upon the magnification, not the size of the image, but by what's called monocular clues. You would know by things such as who's covered up by whom in the photo. But if we look at this photograph of a couple of golfers, you see a gentleman in the green over here on the left and a gentleman in a light blue shirt over there at the right, and you notice that there is an image size difference here. If I were to ask you which golfer is closer to the camera, you would think that it would be the gentleman in green because the image size is larger than the image of the gentleman in blue. So if we wanted to ask, how do we know this mathematically? We would have to go back to U plus D equal V, which is still a great tattoo. So we're asking, how does the object location determine that image size? We know that it does. But how does that mathematically work? We have already figured out that with this formula, u plus d equal v, that object location determines image location. But how does it determine size? It turns out that u over v gives us that two-dimensional magnification that we saw in that golfing photograph. And you can see here I've got two circles of different sizes here by height and width, two-dimensional. There are also synonyms that you should be aware of, lateral magnification, transverse magnification, linear magnification. It's all the same stuff. So since we're going to look at this mathematically, let's put some numbers to this. Let's say that rays come from an object 10 centimeters away, and they're going to hit this plus 5 lens. What is the lateral mag? How do we figure that out? It's going to be u over v, so we just work our simple lens formula, just as always. And since 10 centimeters away, 100 divided by 10 is 10, it's going to be minus because the rays are diverging. It tells us it's a plus 5, and then we can calculate v. And if we can do that, then we can calculate u over v. And so you can see here the answer is 2, meaning that the image is 2 times bigger than the object. And so any time that it's greater than 1, we're going to get magnification. Here's one where the object is 50 centimeters away from a plus 6 lens. That means that u is going to be a minus 2. We know it's a plus 6. That gives a 4. But now u over v is less than 1. And anytime it's going to be less than 1, that is going to be minification, meaning that the image is smaller than the object. Now here we have an object 50 centimeters away. It hits a plus 4. And that's going to be minus 2, 100 divided by 50. And then we calculate that u over v equals 1. Again, doesn't matter, plus or minus 1. When we have an exact number of 1, there is no magnification. Zero mag, the object and the image are identical in size. So in this problem, we've got an object 10 centimeters away. It's hitting this unknown lens. We have to kind of figure out where the lens, what the lens is. It's producing a lateral mag of minus 5. Oh, we don't have to know what the lens is. It wants to know where is the image? And so once again, we're working lots of problems here, and that is the key to optics. And so what we're going to do here is what we always do. We're going to write down what we know and see what we can figure out. And so if the object is 10 centimeters away, that makes u minus 10. And we know what u over v is. It's a minus 5. And see, I'm putting question marks here on things I don't know. But I can figure out v from u over v. And that tells me that V is two diopters, and it wants to know how far away is the image located, 50 centimeters. Can I go back and calculate D? Yes. Do I want to do that? Probably not, because I don't care, because it's only asking me about the image. So in U over V, why does object location determine image size? This is what we're asking here. And it turns out that the closer the object is to the lens, the bigger the dioptric power of U. 
we kind of knew that. That's going to give us more magnification. But let's think about that for a moment. If our object is 100 centimeters away from the lens, then what is U? U is 1. 100 divided by 100 is 1. But if our object is closer, if it's 25 centimeters away from the lens, now 100 divided by 25 is 4. So U, the dioptric power, has gotten larger. And since U is the numerator in our formula, the bigger the U, the bigger the size. So the closer things are, the more magnified they are. We've known that instinctively, but mathematically, that is why. Now there's more that U over V can do for you. If it's positive, the image that's formed is upright. Now we said it doesn't matter positive or negative in terms of magnification. Where it does matter is whether or not the image is right side up or upside down. So here I have an object 25 centimeters left of a plus six. What's not only the mag, but the orientation of the image. So we can work through this and we're going to get minus two and a minus U over V gives us an upside down or inverted image. If you thought that was all the fun you could have with U over V, check this out. When U over V is positive, not only is it upright, but it tells you that the object and the image are on the same side of the lens. And when U over V is negative, they're on opposite sides. When you get magnification, the object is closer than the image to the lens and reverse for minification. And of course, if they are the same distance from the lens, you're going to get a U over V of one, no magnification. So why in the world do you care about any of that? Check this out. You could be in a testing situation where they don't give you numbers, just a diagram like this. They would say, I've got an object over here at the green arrow and it forms an image at location A. Tell me about magnification or minification. Tell me if it's upright or inverted. And then you would use those laws of U over V to figure that out. So you could look at that and say that, well, the object appears to be farther from the lens than the image, and I know that that gives me minification, and it's easy to see that they're on opposite sides, and so that tells me that it's inverted, and so I know that it's choice D. But what if you couldn't remember those laws? Then you could do what's called a central ray. In order to draw a central ray, you're going to draw a ray that starts at the top of your object and goes through the middle of the lens, and then at the position where the image is going to be, then you draw your image but there are a few rules that have to be obeyed here. So here we have our central ray. Now, when I draw an image, because my object, the base of the object is on a reference line here, the base of my image has to be on that same reference line. And because the central ray touched the top of my object, the central ray must touch the top of my image. So there's only one way that I can draw it here so that it obeys those two rules. So here we are, linear lateral transverse mag. I've told you everything that I know about that, but we don't live in a two-dimensional world. We have three dimensions, and so the magnification in 3D is called axial magnification, also longitudinal magnification. Again, lots of synonyms out there. The formula is very straightforward. You just take linear magnification and square it. So here we go, object 25 centimeters left of a plus six. What's the axial mag? And you can work through that just like we've been doing. And you get to your minus 2, and then you square it, and you get the axial mag is 4. Now, why is that important? Because of things such as choroidal lesions, optic nerve head edema, retinal fluid around a break, all these things. This is what you're trying to figure out when you look inside the eye is whether or not there's elevation. And that is entirely axial magnification. Now we're going to switch gears. And we're going to talk about a third kind of magnification. This is angular mag. Let me read this for you. Angle of incoming rays formed by a lens compared to the, I'm already bored. And I'm already not understanding what that is. But we're going to figure this out together. So grab your 20 diopter lens. Do you have it? It should be in your pocket. Did you find your 20? Hopefully you did. I've got a small piece of paper here that says no magnification on it. I'd like you to do the same, just uh, any sort of thing that you want to magnify. And we're going to take our 20 diopter lens and we're going to slowly move closer to that until we get something into view. And I can tell you that what I'm seeing is this right here, which is the image flipped vertically and horizontally with some magnification. Now what happens if I push closer to it, I'm going to see this which is a lot of magnification, and the image is now in the same orientation as my original object. This is 
what's called simple magnification, which is the same thing as angular magnification. So let's discuss that just a little bit further, at least mathematically. So here it is. When we're using our 20 diopter lens as a simple magnifier, the formula is very straightforward. It's the diopteric power divided by four. So for a 20 diopter lens, it is five. And in these cases, we put an X behind it. What does the X mean? You've seen that probably on telescopes and things like that, 5X. Uh, that means that it is multiplied by a reference distance, so 5x. In, in our case, for simple magnifiers in ophthalmology, we've all agreed that x is going to equal 4, or a reference distance of 25 centimeters. So 5 times 4 is 20. Here is a classic OCAP question. What's the power of the direct ophthalmoscope? What this question is really asking is, do you know the power of the reduced schematic eye? What is a reduced schematic eye, you might ask? It's a discrete set of measurements made by Dr. Alvar Goldstrand in the early 1900s. And he figured out that in general, if you added the power of the cornea, the K readings, plus the power of the lens, you would get 60 diopters. And so whenever we're talking about an eye in general, everyone's talking about this reduced schematic eye. And unless they're talking about somebody in particular. And so if the question is, what is the magnification of the direct ophthalmoscope as a simple magnifier? We have to use the reduced schematic eye power because the direct ophthalmoscope really isn't giving any power. It's the eye that it's looking at that's giving all the magnification. So we need to take those 60 diopters and we need to divide it by four in order to get the simple or angular magnification. So that's 15x and that is a classic OCAP question. I found myself once in Pinehurst, North Carolina, and I went to the resort, and there's this uh, wonderful uh, place called the Ryder Cup uh, Lounge or, or something like that. I don't remember. Maybe Ryder Cup Bar or Lounge. Anyway, I ordered the burger and sweet potato fries. I love sweet potato fries. This turned out to be the best hamburger I've ever had in my life. I mean, look at this thing. It's like two patties. There's there's bacon in there, uh, lettuce, tomato. They had some kind of topping on there. I don't remember what that was, but it just melts in your mouth. And those sweet potato wedges, oh my gosh. Don't don't worry about what was, the, what was in that glass over there on the right. Not important. Take-home point is, just so happens that the best burger I've ever had in my life uh, is in North Carolina. Have you ever thought about the Snellen chart? and how big that big E is, and what is perfect vision, and how far from the Snellen chart should your patient be, and how do you explain vision on the chart to uh, your patients? Well, what if I told you that the big E subtends five minutes of arc at 400 feet, that perfect vision is 80-80, and it really doesn't matter how far away your patient is, would you believe me? What if I asked you, what distance is the Snellen chart based upon? And then I told you it's not 20 feet. It's actually five feet. So let's get to know the Snellen chart, this wonderful 1862 invention that we still use today. As you know, it's got these big letters on the top that get smaller as we go down. And if you look over on the right hand side, there's a designation and it says 2060 or it says 60. But what does 2060 really mean? Uh, we tell our patients that the numerator is the testing distance and the denominator is the smallest line on the chart you can read, and we're not wrong in saying that. And we tell them that, hey, you could read letters on the 60-foot line and you're 20 feet away, so you're 2060, but it's got to technically mean more than that, right? Well, it does. The Snellen chart is based upon five minutes of arc. So what's a minute of arc? Every circle has 360 degrees, one of those degrees is 1 360th of the circle, obviously. Every degree has 60 minutes of arc. So every one of those 1 360th has 60 minutes of arc. And just one of those tiny little minutes is 1 60th of one degree, so not much. And those letters on the Snellen chart, which we call optotypes, are based upon five of those tiny little minutes. And five is the base unit of our Snellen chart. So when we say someone's 2020, what we're really saying is that from 20 feet away, they can read a letter on that 20 foot line that subtends five minutes of arc. That's what 2020 really means. Now, if we back them up 60 feet away from the chart and they can read something on the 60 foot line, they're now 60, 60. 
they can read a letter of five minutes of arc, the same as 2020. And if I could back them up 400 feet away and look at the chart and they could tell that the big E was a big E and not some other letter, then they can tell optotypes five minutes of arc, the same as if they were 20 feet away and reading off the 2020 line. So 400 over 400 is could be considered perfect vision. That's the beauty of this chart. It does not matter what testing distance I use as long as I'm using a testing distance that's on the right-hand side of that chart. So I could use 40 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet. It does not matter as long as it's listed there. It's a beautiful invention, and it's all based upon five. Now here's something that may help you. You're going to send patients to low vision, or maybe you're going to go into low vision. We'll see. And you're going to have these weird-looking measurements like 5 over 200. And no one outside of low vision knows what that means, right? Uh, we all know what 2020 means, 2040, 2060. So I want to convert that into 2020 terms so that I know what you're talking about. And here's how you do it. I multiply the numerator by 4 to make it 20, but then I have to multiply the denominator by 4 as well to keep an equal ratio. So 5 times 4 is 20, 200 times 4 is 800, so 2800 is the same thing as 5200. So now you can understand whatever that low vision specialist is recording as the vision. But let's go a little deeper into Snellen. If we can read the 5 foot line from 5 feet away, what would the vision be? That'd be pretty close to the chart, wouldn't it? Well, obviously it would be 5 over 5 because that's our testing distance and that's the line that we could read. But what if I couldn't read that 5 foot line? What if from 5 feet away I can only read the 10 foot line? Well, then I'd be 5 over 10. That's still making sense. But what if I then said, okay, you've got your patient that's 5 over 10. How many minutes of arc do the letters on the 10 foot line subtend when you're 5 feet away from the chart? We already said that if I'm 20 feet away from the chart and I can read letters on the 20 foot line, that those letters are going to be five minutes of arc. But now I'm saying that I'm five feet from the chart and I can only read the letters on the 10 foot line. How many minutes of arc are those 10 foot letters when I'm five feet away? Turns out 10 minutes of arc. That's interesting. What about if I'm five feet away and I can read 40 foot line? That's the best I can do. Well, then I'm seeing 40 minutes of arc. That's the beauty of being five feet away on the Snellen chart because it's based on five feet, meaning that those lines tell you the minutes of arc as to how many they can see. But we don't use five feet. We use 20 feet. Now, why do we use 20 feet? It's because we're trying not to have accommodation affect our measurements. So we tend to use 20 feet. So if I were to ask you, how many minutes of arc do letters on the 2080 line subtend when you're at your standard testing distance of 20 feet away? You would then have to take that back down to our five foot testing distance. And because you would have to reduce the numerator from 20 to five, that would be a factor of four, you have to reduce 80 by a factor of four. And so that would be 80 divided by four is 20. So when you can only read the 2080 line, you are reading optotypes or letters that are 20 minutes of arc. So once again, uh, let's look at uh, low vision. If they give me a value of 10, 200, what is this in 2020 terms? Again, uh, I need to get up to 2020, so 10 times 2, and then 200 times 2, so that would be 2,400. So to wrap up the Snellen section of our discussion today, if I were to ask you how big is the big E from 400 feet or from 20 feet, well, hopefully you said that from 400 feet, it's 400 over 400, and those letters are five minutes of arc. But from 20 feet, uh, and I've got 2,400, then I have to divide 20 by 4 to get to 5, and I have to divide 400 by 4, and I would get to 100. So shifting gears here, what magnification are we getting with our 20 diopter lens? We've already said that as a simple magnifier, it's giving us 5x. But when we're looking at an eye, we're not holding it as close to the eye. 
uh, to get that simple magnification, we're a little farther away and we're using linear magnification. And if we're looking at an eye, it becomes the ratio of the power of that eye to the lens. So the reduced schematic eye is once more 60 diopters, and then 60 divided by 20 gives us a magnification of 3. So here it is again as a simple magnifier. It was 5x, but back here, a little farther away, before we got that close, it was 60 divided by 20 is 3. And you can see on that diagram on the right, it's giving you that familiar vertical and horizontal flip. Now, why do you care? Let's compare some lenses here. You can see I've got a 20, I've got a 28, and I've got something called a 14 that you've never seen. And those are really old lenses. I doubt you can uh, find those. They may still make them, but uh, odds are you're never going to see one. And we often will pull a 28 or a 30 diopter lens if the pupil's small and, and we need a bigger field of view, that sort of thing. And you've probably already noticed that the magnification you get with a 20 lens is a lot better than what you get with a 28. And you can see why. Uh, even though linear mag doesn't sound a whole lot different, 3 versus 2.1, in clinical experience, it's a huge difference. But that's not the biggest deal that you should be worried about. What you should be worried about is the difference in the axial magnification. Look at that, 9 versus 4.4. That means that when you're trying to tell whether or not that retina is really detached, you're trying to tell whether or not that choroidal nevus that you can't see at the slit lamp is truly flat or not, uh, that's a hard call when you're using a 28 diopter lens. Much better if you can look at it with a 20 to determine elevation. Hey, when we started looking at an eye with the indirect, why didn't we just use U over V? Why this whole eye to lens ratio thing? And it's because we formed a telescope between the lens that you're holding and the patient's eye. And here's the formula for magnification through a telescope. And I encourage you to read more about telescopes in your optics book uh, because there are lots of telescopes everywhere uh, in ophthalmology. They're in your slit lamp. They're in the lens meter. They're in the loops that you use. Uh, so that's worth knowing. Here's a few more comparisons. Uh, I put on the bottom here what we have with the 78 and 90 that most people use. Do you notice how small the linear magnification is on a 90 diopter lens versus a 20 diopter lens? Have you ever looked at an optic nerve with a 20 diopter lens versus a 90 at the slit lamp? It's a heck of a lot smaller with your indirect, even though you're getting so much more linear magnification. Does that make any sense? Well, it should because you're using the slit lamp to magnify the image that's coming through your 90. So a slit lamp is what's called an astronomical telescope and a Galilean telescope to give you lots of magnification. In most slit lamps, you've got a knob up there that you can turn and get various magnifications. And that's why your 90 is giving you such a larger image than you can see with your 20. Okay, so thank you for spending time with me today. I hope you got a lot out of magnification. I hope that you go back and read the chapter on magnification and work lots and lots of problems. I think that's going to help you in your career, not just in testing, but in your clinical career. And I hope that you join me again, because next we're going to talk about prisms, and that's just a lot of fun. So you guys have a nice day, and thank you again for joining me.